Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrow. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome to GB News on your TV. And I haven't got the remote code. And on your digital radio, I'm Dawn Neeson. I'm Dawn Neeson covering for Nana today. And for the next two hours, me and my panel will be taking on some of the big topics hitting the headlines now. This show is all about opinion. Mine, theirs and yours. We'll be debating, discussing and at times disagreeing. Joining me today, it's former Liberal Democrat MP Lempe Opik and comedian Leo Kurz. Before we get started, let's get the latest news headlines with Bethany Elsie. Dawn, thank you. Good afternoon. It's one minute past four. I'm Bethany Elsie, here to bring you up to date from the GB newsroom. The author, Sir Salman Rushdie, is on a ventilator and may lose an eye after he was attacked on stage at an event in New York State yesterday. The 75-year-old was about to give a lecture at a literary festival when he was repeatedly stabbed in the neck and abdomen. He's faced several death threats since the publication of his book, The Satanic Verses, in the late 1980s. State police says the suspect, 24-year-old Hadi Matar, is in custody and his motive is not yet known. Chief Executive of Humanicists UK, Andrew Copson, said that Rushdie was a champion of freedom of expression. He and his books have become iconic in that cause. And so to see him struck down um, by violence, not by someone who had an answer to his points, but by someone who senselessly violently wanted to silence his voice, really just illustrates one of the great dividing lines in our world today. There are warnings drought conditions in parts of England could last until next year. England is experiencing its driest summer for 50 years and the Environment Agency says it would take weeks worth of rain to replenish water sources. More extreme heat is expected in, in the south of the country this weekend, while the north is set to be hit by thunderstorms and floods. Amber weather warnings have been issued. Dr Simon Boxall is a senior lecturer of oceanography, told GB News there could be more droughts in the future. You compare us now to 1976 when we had the last big drought, we are much better prepared than we used to be. But you have got what is tragically a sort of a, a series of events which has brought this very, very dry weather. And I think we do need to think about this in the future because we are going to see more of these droughts. 
Rail passengers face further disruption as drivers at nine train companies walk out over jobs, pay and conditions. Members of the Aslef Union that represents train drivers joined picket lines in northwest London this morning. Several lines are affected, including services along the west coast, LNER, London Overground and South Eastern. Some parts of the country have no services at all. The Independent's travel editor, Simon Calder, argues that unions are striking now to cause maximum disruption. One person has died and dozens have been injured after a stage collapsed at a music festival near the Spanish city of Valencia. Strong winds caused a section of the main stage at the dance festival to give way. Three people were seriously injured in the incident and 40 are being treated in total. Over 11 tonnes of dead fish have been pulled from a river on the Polish-German border as officials warn of possible contamination. The reason for the mass dying of fish in the river Oder is still unknown. The Polish Prime Minister says it's likely that chemical waste may have been dumped into it. He added that the river may take years to return to its normal state. New court documents show the FBI has seized several top-secret files during a search at Donald Trump's estate in Florida. A federal judge approved a warrant to carry out a search at the former president's Mar-a-Lago property. It's after the US government said it's possible he had violated the Espionage Act, a law that prohibits passing on or keeping national defence information. Mr Trump has denied any wrongdoing and said the items were declassified. The Welsh Secretary has become the first Cabinet Minister to publicly switch sides in the Tory leadership race, putting his support behind Liz Truss. Writing in the Daily Telegraph, Sir Robert Buckland says he believed the Foreign Secretary's economic policy would help the country through the current cost-of-living crisis. Speaking to Esther and Philip, Brexit Minister Jacob Rees-Mogg also said he's backing Liz Truss. I think having somebody um, who understands that what they thought earlier in life isn't right, and particularly with the referendum, accepts enthusiastically what the British people gave her to deal with. And she's not alone in that. I, I've always thought the most impressive Remainers are the ones who, once the result came in, said, OK, that's it, I'm accepting it, and I want now to do it properly. And there are a number of those. There are quite a lot who say that and don't really mean it. But I found in government that Liz, other than the Prime Minister himself, was my greatest supporter for getting Brexit opportunities. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens now. Let's get back to Dawn. Hi, I'm Dawn Neeson. I'm covering for the lovely Nana today on GB News, on TV and on digital radio. Now... I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king. No, not me, obviously, because I really don't want a bloke's stomach, especially not one of the beer belly kind. Nope. <laughs> this afternoon, we're having a bit of a history lesson courtesy of Elizabeth I, who uttered that famous quote while rallying her troops to face the Spanish Armada. She often roared this morale-raising rhetoric whilst wearing armour, you know, the kind of chainmail stuff that keeps you alive should someone fancy aiming an arrow in your direction, which happened quite a lot back then. So far, so ultimate girl power, right? Woman in a man's job, fierce, feisty and fearless, yet feminine enough to worry about her hair and makeup at the same time. Ah, but hold on, not so fast, because according to London, Globe Theatre, the fact that Queen Liz used the word king and wore battle dress in, check notes, uh, battle, meant that she was, wait for it, yep, non-binary. Oh, for goodness sake, where does this utter madness stop? Yesterday, the very same theatre announced that their new play about Joan of Arc centred on the fact that one of France's favourite patron saints also didn't identify as a woman and would have used the pronouns they and them. They also issued a picture of the actress playing the role wearing a chest binder to flatten her breasts. Oh, just yuck. As Jones successfully led several French military actions in bloody battles against the English, very much doubt she gave a monkey's what her pronouns were. Having a sword about to be rammed into your guts would possibly have that effect. Ah. But herein lies the crux of this matter. Both Joan and Elizabeth were women in charge of men. 
and we can't have that, can we? Perish the thought that the women in history who led the way for female emancipation so much that they have become feminist icons were just ordinary girls who didn't play by the rules men set them. Can't wait for someone to suggest that the famous uh, Celtic warrior Boudicca actually identified as Bernard on her days off. It's frankly hilarious that in an effort to be so achingly inclusive and diverse, today's modern day wokerati are effectively cancelling 50% of the world's population. Modern day heroines JK Rowling and Olympic swimmer Sharon Davis receive death and rape threats almost daily for daring to defend women's rights. Their home addresses are posted online with haters encouraged to intimidate and threaten them. Look, of course, the globe have every right to their opinions and every right to put whatever play they want on. If you don't like it, simply don't go and see it. It's called freedom of expression. And much more of that coming up later. But likewise, you and I also have every right to our opinions and should be allowed to speak out as we see fit too. Doesn't always work like that though, does it? When I dared do a very harmless tweet about women's rights, I was temporarily placed in Twitter jail for hate speech. The fact that the woman who threatened to rape me for daring to post my thoughts had no action taken spoke volumes. Female role models in history are pretty thin on the ground in the first place. We have spent decades rediscovering women artists, authors, leaders and yes, warriors. Now a regressive ideology is trying to take them away in the name of something they call progress. Let's be honest, the whole premise of Queen Elizabeth or Joan of Arc being non-binary is basically just a load of spherical objects. The very spherical objects that our two heroines definitely didn't have. Before we get stuck into the debate though, here's what else we have coming up today. At five o'clock, it's Difficult Conversations, and today is all about destigmatizing women, yes, it's us again, in a male-dominated profession. Male-dominated industries and occupations are particularly vulnerable to reinforcing harmful stereotypes and creating unfavorable environments. They make it even more difficult for women to excel. I'll be joined by the general manager of Dynamo, Dino Rod Plumbing even, Natalie McAllister, about being a female plumber. And for the great British debate this hour, I'm asking, is free speech under threat? We've just been talking about that one, haven't we? Yesterday, controversial novelist Salman Rushdie was stabbed as he was about to give a lecture in Western New York. The attack sparked a debate over the preservation of free speech and its future. Can there really be a future for freedom of speech if we are at risk of assault if we speak freely? And in Royal Roundup, with the Duke of Sussex tell all autobiography about to land in bookstores ahead of Thanksgiving and Christmas in the States, people are wondering how much of this personal memoirs will be edited by his wife. <laughs> That's coming up in the next hour. I want to know what you think on everything we're discussing. Though. Email me at gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews. Right, let's get cracking, shall we? Welcome again to my panel, a Liberal Democrat MP, Olympic Opic, and comedian Leah Cass. Welcome, gentlemen. Great to be back. I've got Team Boy with me today. This is <laughs> going to be an interesting one, isn't it? <laughs> right, OK, so especially given that monologue, apologies. It wasn't, it wasn't personal, OK? I do like that, honestly. I don't know, I don't know. Couldn't eat a whole one. <laughs> um, right, first, I want to discuss the story we were just talking about. Lempit Leo, what do you think? Women being cancelled. Joan of Arc, Queen Elizabeth I were both obviously non-binary. Leo, we'll come to you first. Well, the, You're um, a comedian, you can tell the funny side of this, can't you? <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's impossible to satirise it at this point. <laughs> I mean, they're putting on a play and they're saying that because uh, Joan of Arc uh, displayed masculine traits, you know, she wore trousers and, you know, with, uh, led men into battle and had short hair and whatever, that she must have been non-binary. And it's such a regressive way of looking at men and women. I mean, for all that they say that they're progressive and they've got new views and they're driving things forward, 
forward. This this seems a lot like 1950s sexism, where it's like, oh, women women stay in the home and have flowers and dainty dresses and stuff, and, and men, you know, wear trousers and go out and fight battles. So uh, it's, it's an absolute nonsense. We've known we've known for a number of decades now that women can be soldiers, women can do you know whatever whatever men men can do. Uh, so it's, it's nonsense to to suddenly revise the history and erase uh, erase Joan of Arc's uh, womanhood. This is the weirdness of it, isn't it? It's it's, it's supposedly in the name of equality and inclusion, and yet it's actually the opposite of equality. Because yeah. it's telling women that if you don't look like a woman, don't dress like a woman, like have short hair, for example, mm. then obviously you're obviously a boy. You just pretend to be one. Let me what you make of this. It's actually worse than that because it can't be any worse, surely. It, it can be because if you look at the percentage of people, we, Tavistock was being mentioned in the program before oh, yes. us. They're beginning to tell people that maybe you should seriously consider whether you're non-binary. Now, let's be honest, the overwhelming majority of people are fairly comfortable in their gender. It doesn't diminish the issues that the others have. But why is it that we have a political system that wants to talk endlessly about something which must be addressed, but probably isn't quite as important as the cost of living crisis or the war that's going on in Ukraine? Now, let's look at the Joan of Arc thing. She was 19 when she got burned at the stake. Yeah. Oh, we're now expected to and believe... And by the way, that was something they did to women, didn't they? They didn't burn men at the stake that often. Maybe she'd got away with it if they'd known she was non-binary. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hello, I'm a boy. I'm a boy. Yeah. Actually, don't burn me. Yeah. yeah and, and this is the thing. She was 19. She didn't have time to start massinating about what I think is, as Leo suggested, a current-day fashion. It's important we get this sorted out. But come on, let's keep it on perspective. Mm. I've got two daughters. I don't really want them to spend the next 15 years thinking they have to work out if they're non-binary or not. It'll come naturally. Just if we're not in a prejudiced society, it'll come naturally. We don't have to have it rammed down our throat. Mm. In fairness, I reckon that this theatre is doing it for a bit of publicity. We're talking about it. Well, uh, and that's yeah, maybe the reason I, it's I wasn't going, going to mention that because I am talking about it. And look, and they have every right. I mean, you know, as a comedian, Leo, you know, freedom of speech is very important, isn't yeah. it? So what they're doing, I, I, find, I don't find it offensive as such. I get annoyed about it because I'm a feminist, I'm a woman, I'm all for women's rights, etc., which obviously get me threatened all, <laughs> all the time. Um, but freedom of speech is important, isn't it, surely? So they have the right to do this, but I have the right to be angry about it as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And like Lambert says, I mean, that, that to and fro on, on social media with some people saying, oh my God, no, it's wonderful. I've got non-binary <laughs> representation. And then other people saying, oh no, this is terrible. You're raising women. That, that just creates a lot of, a lot of noise and uh, means a lot, a lot more people know about this play that, uh, that wouldn't, you know, know about it or, or go and see it. I mean, I'd be interested to, to see if it, if it sells out. Um, I know, you know, when, when there is a fuss made about, about plays, it's not always uh, positive. There's a, um, a, a woke theatre group trying to put on a, a naked sex show for, for children. What? <laughs> I'm not even joking. It's called, Sorry, a what? naked sex a show for children? It was called, uh, well, they, they had to be accompanied by their, by their family. I mean, it didn't say they had to be accompanied by their family, but I'd assume you wouldn't get, you know, uh, six-year-olds going along. But yeah, and it was for, it was for uh, you know, ages five and up, or four and up, I think it was. What? And uh, basically, it was called the, the Family Sex Show, and it was all about um, gender and pronouns and, uh, you know, non-binariness and also uh, sexual intercourse. So uh, at as, some point in the play, they got naked. And, uh, yeah, I mean... It, How can I, this be all right? It's not. How can it's this not, be all right? And the, the weird thing is, the weird thing... So, obviously, people exercise their freedom of speech to, to demonstrate about it, you know, to, to say, wait a minute, this, this, sounds, this sounds wrong. And then the people who were, who were doing that were accused of, uh, of being far-right extremists. It's like, that's not far-right extremis extremism. That's mum's net. It's, 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 yeah, it's, mum's net. Oh, 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 no, what, what was the point? What were they trying to prove by teaching, letting kids watch well, naked people having sex? Well, there's a, there's a great move. As, as Lambert says, there's a, there's a big movement to sort of uh, introduce these ideas about gender and, and progressive, you know, all the pronoun nonsense and the gender. We would introduce that to, to children when they're young and impressionable. And then you put the idea in their head. And then, you know, because kids are, kids are sponges. They absorb anything. It's like, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a dinosaur, yes, all the yes, rest of it. Yeah. And then, of course, they're going to school. They're like, oh, I want to be, you know, I'm a boy. I'm a, you know, whereas normally you just, you know, you can 
play, uh, boys can play with dolls, you know, girls can play with, 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 with an action man. It doesn't, it doesn't mean it doesn't anything. Mean anything. Like being, being a man has always covered a, a gamma, a, a whole range of, uh, of, of behaviours from, you know, you've got David Bowie, you've got Hulk Hogan. They're, they're, both, they're both men. It doesn't mean one's non-binary or one's transmasculine or whatever. It's just, you know, this is, is that just... Is your own, that, on transmasculine? That's good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the, the, it's just, it's posh people. It's middle class people with too much time to sit yeah. around and think. Leo's right. You don't get people uh, living in unemployment in difficult countries talking about, no, oh, my true. first priority is to work this out whether true. my children are non-binary yeah. or not. Yeah. It's like, can we eat, drink this water without getting yeah. the runs? Yeah. That's a rather more important yes. thing. Yeah. And, and what I find stunning, just like you said, is that the Putney folks, no offence to Putney, they sit Price. there... Price. Metaphorically speaking, Putney and there are other very posh places are also available. But they, they, you've got the time and your dinner parties to talk about these things. But if, if you're going to work at five in the morning to clean the, um, the, the bins and the floors of the people who live in those posh houses yeah. and talk about it, your first priority is non-binary gender. And I'll tell you something else. Angelina, my five-year-old, she's told me what she wants to be. She wants to be a ballerina and a farmer. Mm. So <laughs> we bought her a tractor <laughs> and some ballet shoes and she dresses as a princess. That'll work it out. Yeah. As you say, Leo, I'm not going to say, now let's think about the implications of farming. What's motivating you? Is that because you are non-binary and you want to take a primarily uh, male stereotype job? I don't say that. I say, here's a tractor. Let's go down to, um, uh, to um, Hobble Down Farm and stroke some of the animals and see mm. how that goes. But you're not allowed to do this when it comes to non-binary or binary because you're not allowed to be mm. what used to be called normal. Maybe that was uh, oh, an out of date what, phrase. What is normal yeah, now? Normal is probably offending phrase, somebody. But it's not allowed, you're not allowed to be primarily heterosexual without having to justify yeah. it. Mm. That's how it feels to me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure we'll come back to this. Because the one question I want to ask you both, but I'm going to leave this one till later, is why is this never done to men? <laughs> why is it two female historical figures? But you can answer that one later. We have to move on now. Uh, I'm Dawn Neeson. I'm covering for the lovely Nana today on GB News, on your TV and on digital radio. After the break, it's time for the great British debate this hour. I'm asking, is free speech under threat? <laughs> Yesterday, a controversial novelist, Salman Rushdie, was stabbed as he was about to give a lecture in Western New York. The attack has sparked a debate over the preservation of free speech and its future. Can there really be a future for freedom of speech if we are at risk of a sort if we speak freely? Send us an email, gbnews at, gb, gbviews at gbnews.uk and tell us what you think. You can also tweet gbnews and there's a poll up right now asking, is free speech under threat? Cast your vote because you can have free speech here all you like. First vote, it's the weather forecast. Looking ahead to this evening's weather and the UK is looking warm for many as temperatures only slowly fall away across the country. Let's take a look at the details. There will be plenty of late evening sunshine across the southwest of England with only light breezes. It will be feeling warm with temperatures still in the mid to high 20s. The temperatures across the southeast of England may be even warmer and still be in the low 30s this evening. Some high cloud may make the sunshine a little hazy though before sunset. High cloud may also be across the skies in Wales, possibly giving a vivid sunset this evening. It will be feeling warm with temperatures still in the mid to high 20s. Cloud could also be bubbling up this evening across the Midlands, but it will remain dry though with light and variable winds as well. Temperatures this evening likely to remain in the low 30s. Northeast coast of England may have a rather gloomy evening as some sea fog moves in, but for many, the day will end on a very warm and sunny note. The low cloud and fog will also affect the north and east coast of Scotland. The high ground may also see a shower develop, but for most, it will be dry and warm. It's a similar story in Northern Ireland as we end the day with perhaps some cloud near the coast, but for most, it will be sunny and feeling warm. Overnight, we may see some showers develop in the northwest, but for most, it will be dry and remaining warm. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, Talking Pints 
but over a drink, we have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown up way. Come and join me on Farrow. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hi, I'm Dawn Neeson. I'm covering for Nana today on GB News, on TV and on digital radio. It's time for the great British debate. I'm asking, is free speech under threat? Yesterday, controversial novelist Salman Rushdie was stabbed as he was about to give a lecture in Western New York. Mr Rushdie went into hiding with police protection in the UK after Iran's top leader called for his murder over the novel The Satanic Verses which some Muslims deemed blasphemous. The attack has sparked up a debate over the preservation of free speech and its future. Can there really be a future for freedom of speech if we are a risk of assault if we speak freely? So, in the Great British Debate this hour, I'm asking, is free speech under threat? I'm joined on the phone now by a politi politician and broadcaster, Iman Ajmal Masur. Hello, hi, can you, can you hear me? I, I can, I'm sorry, I'm on the boot. Uh, no, I... And, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm obviously agreed to do my best to answer as much as I can. Th thank you, Ajma, I can't thank you enough for joining us and I heard you speak very eloquently on this subject this morning, which is why I wanted to talk to you about it. And thank you for joining us from a boat. You're actually fishing in the channel, I understand, are you? That's right, I'm fishing. <laughs> Marvellous. Well, thank you so much for sparing time to, to talk to us this afternoon. Right, um, just, just what, can you explain why the satanic verses in particular is considered so offensive to Muslims? Well, this is the issue. I don't know if we understand the topic itself. When we say it's offensive to Muslims, we want to, I, I want to understand what is it that we are saying. Is criticising Prophet Muhammad offensive? And is criticizing Prophet Muhammad not allowed? Actually, according to Islam, there is nothing that prohibits a person from criticizing the Prophet, criticizing Islam. That's not the issue. The issue here is everybody is free to say what they want, but we should all be responsible for what we say. Right. But even if we say things irresponsibly, should we then be put to death? The answer is no. No religion, no society would want ever or should ever support putting a person to death just because they've expressed themselves freely. Engage with that person, express your views openly, challenge them intellectually. Why even threaten them? I think that's very uncivilized. It's incredibly uncivilized. So obviously what has happened to Salman Rushdie is appalling and no one is condoning it. Um, but the, the, the fatwa does still exist, doesn't it? So, I mean, how do you feel that the majority of Muslims around the world now are feeling about the situation we are in, where this has been linked to the fatwa on, on Salman Rushdie? Um, how do you think about, you know, what people are feeling about this? It must be quite upsetting for them. I think majority of the Muslims would have not, I think the vast majority of the Muslims of younger age group 
would not have been even born when this uh, fatwa came out 30 years ago. I was 18 years old, if I remember correctly, when this fatwa was given by the uh, leader of uh, Iran, one of the Ayatollahs. Uh, firstly, it was Iranian cleric who gave that fatwa. Secondly, they don't represent the vast majority of the Muslims, keeping in mind Iran probably constitutes less than 10% of the Muslim population of the, of the world. And even the Iranians won't support their clerics on these issues because they know these hardliners mm. have a particular view and they use it in their country to further their particular interests. So Muslims across the globe won't have any support for this fatwa. However, what Muslims would say is that we should be consistent. Why do you want to go around insulting and offending anybody anyway? You are free to say what you like. Just like I can't be racist, just like I can't be anti-Semitic, why is it okay to attack Islam and the Muslims so freely? We should have the right to criticize Islam, no problem. We should have the right to uh, put Islam to test and have intellectual discussions and debates, of course. But to mock people, to insult people should be... There should be a line drawn. But everyone agrees, Muslims and non-Muslims. Nobody should be put to death. Nobody should be violently threatened for expressing themselves freely. That's where the line is drawn. That's it. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate uh, your time this morning, uh, this afternoon, Ajmal, and, uh, um, and hopefully the fishing goes well for you. Now, I mean, Ajmal's raised some important points there, so let's move on to talk to uh, one of the co-founders of Conservatives Against Racism for Equality, Albi um, and Makona. Um, Albi, you obviously heard what Ajmal said there. I mean, firstly, what do you think about what's happened to Salman Rushdie? I'm absolutely devastated to hear about what's happened to Sir Salman Rushdie, you know, stabbed up to 15 times uh, because of a book that he's written based on a point of view that he has. Um, and to answer your question, yes, I do think free speech is under attack. You know, we saw the assassination of Theo van Gogh in 2004. We saw the Charlie Hebdo attacks in 2015, the murder of Samuel Patey in 2020, the Bateley Grammar School teacher who went into hiding uh, in 2021. And just this week, we have seen this brutal attack on Sir Salman Rushdie. Um, and this is is totally unacceptable. You know, it was Voltaire who said, I detest what it is that you have to say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. And we seem to be missing that understanding of what free speech is all about. And it, and it is the bedrock of Western liberal democracy. So, uh, I mean, Albie, does that mean that we all have carte blanche to say what we want, obviously provided it's not a criminal offence, but we all have, you know, the right to be offensive. We, we do have the right, more or less, to say what we want, but obviously there are consequences to our actions. And those consequences cannot be that you go into hiding with something that you say about a particular religion or a particular ideology, or that you are stabbed or that you are killed, of course there are consequences for people's actions. And if you say something horrible to someone, you can't be surprised when they react badly. But the idea that people have to go into hiding or lose their jobs or are killed because of things that they say is an anathema. Quite, and I think so say all of us. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Albie. Appreciate your views there. Uh, right, let's have a, a quick look at what you've been saying um, uh, on your messages. Uh, Charles says, if the majority of people in the UK don't want to allow people to have freedom of speech, it will come to an end. The question is really is when will that threshold point be reached? Some would say we may have crossed it. Tony, you say, how can anyone live their life being offended all the time? Are they not adults? Do they not understand that people have a right to an opinion? Meanwhile, Robert says, I believe we are able to speak more freely in other societies. In this country, we have a huge list of things I feel we can and can't say. Perhaps free speech should be renamed partially free speech. Oh, it's sad that people are thinking like that, isn't it? Right, oh, well, I'm Dawn Neeson. I'm covering for Nana today on GB News, on TV and digital radio. After the break, we'll continue with the Great British Debate. I'm asking, is free speech under threat? You'll hear the thoughts of my panel, Liberal Democrat MP Lempi Opik and comedian Leo Kurth. First, it's the latest news headlines with Bethany Elsie.
Dawn, thank you. Good afternoon. It's 4.31. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB newsroom. Sir Salman Rushdie's alleged attacker has been charged with attempted murder in the second degree. US officials identified the suspect as 24-year-old Hadi Matar from New Jersey. The motive for the assault is not yet known, but police believe the suspect was acting alone. Earlier today, the author's agent confirmed Mr Rushdie is on a ventilator and that he may lose an eye after he was repeatedly stabbed on stage at an event in New York State yesterday. He's faced several death threats since the publication of his book The Satanic Verses in the late 1980s. There are warnings drought conditions in parts of England could last until next year. The country is experiencing its driest summer for 50 years and the Environment Agency says it would take weeks worth of rain to replenish water sources. More extreme heat is expected in the south this weekend, while the north is set to be hit by thunderstorms and floods. Rail passengers face further disruption as drivers at nine train companies walk out over jobs, pay and conditions. Members of the ASLEF union that represents train drivers joined picket lines in northwest London this morning. Several lines are affected, including services along the west coast, LNER, London Overground and South Eastern. Some parts of the country have no services at all. And record numbers of people are getting checked for bowel cancer following the death of Dame Deborah James. The NHS has praised her campaigning, saying it's encouraged people to take the illness seriously and speak to their GPs. NHS figures show over 170,000 people went for checks between May and July. Dame Deborah, known as Bowel Babe, died from the disease at the end of June, age 40. This is TV online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. We'll get back to Dawn in just a moment. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrow. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hi, I'm Dawn Neeson. I'm covering for Nana today on GB News and on Digital Radio. Back to our great British debate this hour. I'm asking, is free speech under threat? With the awful attack on Salman Rushdie, a novelist most well known for his book, The Satanic Verses, the topic of free speech has again risen its ugly head. I'm asking how this attack has impacted free speech and if free speech is in jeopardy. Not on this channel, it's not, that's for sure. So for the great British debate this hour, I'm asking, is free speech under threat? 
Let's see what my panel make of that. I'm joined by former Liberal Democrat MP, Olympic Opic, and comedian Leo Gers. Right, OK, well, Leo, we, we touched on this earlier, but as a comedian, obviously, free speech is incredibly important to your profession. So what do you make of what's happened to um, Salman Rushdie and, and where it leaves us with the fact that we now have to be very, very aware of the consequences of what we write, uh, do a show about, paint pictures about, put statues to. Mm. Yeah, no, I mean, it, re it really worries me. I mean, uh, Rushdie was a, a sat or is a satirist, so, uh, so you know, he's, he's a type of comedian. He was giving a, a public speaking performance, uh, so the, obviously being attacked on stage is something that does happen to mm. comedians uh, sometimes. Uh, at the moment, the, the constraints on free speech and comedy are coming from two directions. So there's, uh, there's the wokists, uh, who you know want to want to shut you down if you you know say anything that's uh, that's perceived to be transphobic or racist or, or whatever. Which obviously you know a lot of comedy we, we play with boundaries and we've seen this this happen a lot with with comedians such as Jeff Innocent who aren't saying anything uh, anything racist at all, but somebody misinterprets it or, or takes it out of context as with Ricky Gervais's uh, comments. The other side, uh, Islamists are uh, encroaching on freedom of speech in comedy. We've seen uh, comedians being murders when the Taliban took over control in, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, they, they murdered uh, Nazar Mohammed, uh, who's, who's a comedian who mocked the, the Taliban. Uh, recently, we've seen Crack House Comedy Club in Kuala Lumpur shut down. It's a fantastic club. Mm. I've played there many times. Um, and somebody at an open mic night got up and, and said something that was deemed to be Islamophobic, and it's, been, it's had its entertainment and license revoked and, you know, death threats and all the rest of it. In this country, Freddie Quinn, uh, Freddie Quinn was on a, was on a podcast, and um, he made a call comment uh, about, um, I don't know if I can repeat it, about uh, why he, li he, w he liked dating um, Muslim women because uh, the thing that tur turned him on was the amount of uh, dishonour it would bring on, on the family. And it was, a, it was a very, I mean, I can see why people got offended. It was a very funny, funny comment. He had hundreds of death yeah. threats. So, you know, comedians, the, the biggest censorship isn't the sort of people coming in and, you know, taking away in chains like they did with Lenny Bruce. The biggest censorship for a comedian is self-censorship. We worry about, uh, you know, what the Police will do now because if you say something that's, that's deemed transphobic, you can you can get get arrested. We've seen that with Count Dankula, with various other people, um, and uh, we we worry about what woke people are going to say and you know us getting um, you know misconstrued as as racist or bigots or whatever. And we also worry uh, about the threat of. Uh, I mean, Islam is going to be the biggest religion in the UK by 2050 if current trends continue. So this is going to increasingly be um, something that we have to we have to take into account. It's that void get stronger. Uh, I think the the foundation of Western liberal democracy could be could be eroded, and free speech you know won't won't exist anymore. I mean, just today, Jerry Sadowitz, Jerry Sadowitz, one of the greatest comedians in the UK, mm. cancelled from his Edinburgh Fringe run because because somebody so somebody came to his show or pe people at his uh, show complained. Um, apparently, venue staff complained as well. But Jerry Sadowitz is you know everybody knows he's the most offensive what? comedian. So you know nobody nobody. Knowingly goes to Jerry Sadowitz. Uh, you, you, they'd only go to. They know what they're getting, so they must have gone maliciously. So, so Lempe, Lempe, are we looking now to be offended? I mean, are we going to things and, and and viewing things with a view, with one eye on the fact that we might be offended? We can complain most, about it. Most people don't, but now it's okay to do exactly that. Leo and myself have had arguments on air, very heated arguments. But I don't think less of Leo, no. even when he's poked of, fun of at me, because that's the essence. You asked an interesting question before. I was Do right you as well. Have the right? You're completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that's your oh, attitude. God. You speak to the hand. Uh, You're so cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you said it before. Do we have the right to cause offence? And Albie's right. You have to have the right to cause offence because. It's meaningless to say we've got free speech if you're not offended by anything that's said because no one's going to object. So a small proportion of people now feel the right to try to cancel the, the objectionable things that they don't like. And actually, I won't go into the debate again. I ended up having a, an almost all-night session on Twitter talking about whether we had the right to argue about the subject. Of course we do. Now, I think there are actually three elements to this. Uh, we can't really talk about the current situation because it's No, of course, because somebody has been charged now. But, so. but I think of another one, Malcolm X. Malcolm X was killed because people didn't really like what he was doing. That was a long time ago. Uh, Martin Luther King was killed because he was really an inconvenient truth to white racists. So this isn't a new phenomenon. 
but I put them in a particular category. This has happened all the time. The two things that really worry me are the, the, the cantal culture, where people actually use censorship as a way to prevent their opponents from doing well. Somebody actually said I shouldn't be on television, on GB News, said live I shouldn't be on television because I'm questioning uh, the human effect on, on global warming. Bring it on. Have the debate with me. But have don't tell debate. me I can't have the discussion. Yeah. Mm. But the yeah. bigger thing I'm worried about is state uh, oppression. When, for example, everybody knows I'm very unhappy with the BBC because they don't think they want to ba have balance. They don't feel they need to have balance on that same subject. When the state or, or arms of the state begin to censor groups, that's when you end up with totalitarianism. Mm. I've given you one example there, but there are others too. And I, we were talking about gender before. Leo should have every right to make a, 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 a stand up set if he wanted to. That's offensive because. That's what humour's doing, is pushing so, the boundaries. Absolutely, and, and obviously all of us that are sensible reserve the right to be upset and to not enjoy that humour, but then mm. I simply don't go, as you said about Sadowich, I don't go to see yeah. that show. So I don't like sushi, so I don't go to sushi restaurants. Yeah. <laughs> I don't go into a sushi restaurant, eat the sushi, and then say, oh my God, this is disgusting. <laughs> this place should be shut down. Well, hold on, Leo, what's wrong with sushi? Yeah, it's what is wrong with sushi? No, but yeah, you what have you got so a sushiist? It's yeah. too I mean, me. It's too what? Too small. Too small. Just buy too small. more of it. No, that, that's not. <laughs> Just buy a, more of it. I want a big... So does this mean, gentlemen, that every... You know, I mean, you know, there have been jokes recently made about the Holocaust, about rape, about paedophilia. All of those things are acceptable to no. make jokes and write books no. about. No, or well, are they, Lempe? Well, well, I think with freedom comes responsibility. And I've... I've I've made a failureous attempt at Leo's career. Uh, people had the right not to laugh, unfortunately. <laughs> so, so I do something else instead now. But uh, I chose not to go down that path. But I absolutely, as an individual, am willing to sit in a room where people are saying things that are out of order. There's a hilarious sketch about um, Greta Thunberg. Um, really, really funny um, uh, sketch. But other people found it offensive because it was challenging little Greta. That's pathos, and that's how we challenge the boundaries. Uh, is, there, is there a limit? For me, there is. But as long as you're not inciting violence, inciting actual oppression, as long as I'm not telling you you should hate the people I'm mocking... But there are criminal laws that dictate yeah, what you can and can't there. say about things they're like that. They're already there. So, so yeah. Leo, as a comedian, anything, uh, Holocaust, rape, paedophilia, all of those are acceptable subjects for jokes. Yeah, you can make it funny. I've seen loads of hilarious Holocaust jokes. I mean, look at Mel Brooks' entire oeuvre. Like, you know, so many films, he, he, mocks, he mocks the Holocaust and takes the, you know, really sort of, um, uh, takes the, the threat out of, out of fascism and exposes, you know, Hitler and, and the Nazis for how ridiculous they, mm. they are. Mm. Um, and, yeah, I mean, we've, we've got laws, mm. but there, there are increasingly more laws. We've got the Online Safety Bill, we've got the Hate Crime Bill in Scotland that are further restricting, you know, bringing in this yeah, state yeah, intimidation yeah. and this, this state restriction. But yeah, comedians, you don't need to censor comedians because we're already performing in front of a jury. If we say yeah. so, something that is genuinely horrible, people won't laugh. So we don't, we don't need to be, we don't need some other third parties coming in and, and uh, interfering in that, that How process. How patronising is it that we say the public can't listen to this kind of thing because they're too stupid Absolutely. to make their own yeah. judgment? Now, th these are all our opinions, by the way. We're all in to opinions. No, these are facts. Absolutely, yeah, yeah no, but oh, <laughs> we're also expressing <laughs> Opinions, which is what we are entitled to do. So, uh, right, but this show is nothing without you and your views. So let's welcome one of our great British voices. And this is your opportunity to be on the show and tell us what you really think about the topics we're discussing. This hour, we're heading over to Grimsby to talk to GB viewer Alan McNeely. Hello, Alan. Good afternoon, Don. How are you? All right? I'm very good, thank you. And how are you? Fine, thank you. Excellent. Right, so what would you like to say about free speech? You are free to speak exactly as you want on here. So what would you like to say? Well, apart from this latest horrific incident against Salman Rushdie, if you take this country itself on its own, free speech has been under threat probably since the late 70s. Uh, ever since the PC Brigade came into being, which has evolved into the Woke Brigade, uh, all kinds of aspects of normal life are now being monitored and criticised and looked at. So everybody takes offence at everything now. Mm. So no matter what you say, uh, I'm getting on in years. The jokes that I learned at school, I couldn't tell you. I'd be arrested for them. Uh, and it's as simple as that. Programmes that I watched on the TV are banned or censored or come with a trigger warning. And the whole country seems to be moving into an era where 
it's you do as you're told, you think as we think, or you're not allowed to think. But I pick up on Lambert's point where he said about state intervention, and that is worrying the way the state seems to be moving more and more into what people say online, and that shouldn't be happening because you can take anything that anybody says, take it out of context, and then say, oh, well, I'm offended by that. Well, it's nonsense. I mean, it might be that I wanted to offend you, or it might be that you've just taken offence. Either way, I don't really care, because I should be able to say what I want to say freely and openly without fear of being arrested for it. Alan, Alan, obviously, you know, no wants to be offensive or say anything that is actually, you know, against criminal law. But, I mean, do you find yourself then constantly censoring what you might say in public? I've had to do that for years now. It's not just something that cropped up over the, the last couple of years since everyone's talking about the woke culture. Going back to the 80s, through the 90s, the language was changing. What was acceptable in society was changing. So what may have been acceptable to me at one point was suddenly no longer acceptable. So you, you find yourself constantly having to think, well, can I say this? Or maybe I shouldn't say this. Or you do say it. And then you can see that somebody has an adverse reaction to it when in actual fact there's nothing meant by it. It's just that they're in that sort of, oh, I'll pick up on that, mm. as opposed to that's just a normal everyday comment, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And thank you for joining us on a lovely uh, sunny Saturday afternoon, Alan. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Right, now, today I'm asking, is free speech under threat? Uh, loads of you have been getting in touch with this one, and I'm really grateful for all of your views, uh, because this is about free speech. Graham, you say the problem isn't lack of free speech, it's the line people have drawn moving normal opinion into the hate speech category so they can be more offended more often. Quite right. It does seem to be a career option, doesn't it, being offended these days? <laughs> Meanwhile, Jackie, you say, freedom of speech includes listening to the views of those mm. who you disagree with. History teaches us when we silence a voice, wars tend to follow. It's mm. a very good point, actually, Jackie. Meanwhile, Scott, given that it's already a criminal offence to cause offence in Scotland, free speech is dead. OK, interesting. Uh, meanwhile, Dave, you say, it's not only free speech that's at risk, our way of life seems to be too as well. The woke brigade are controlling society through their agenda. Things need to change. Meanwhile, William says, the thought that any of those who cancel, threaten or even take action against anyone who dares disagree with them terrifies me. Their actions mirror abuse to some of the most dreadful and oppressive regimes around the world. Right, OK, there's also a poll up on Twitter throughout today asking, following the attack on author Sir Salman Rushdie, in response to his writing, is free speech under threat? Currently, 94% of you say yes and 6% say no. Hi, I'm Adorn Neeson. I'm covering for Nana today on GB News, on TV and digital radio. After the break, it's the Royal Roundup with the Duke of Sussex's tell-all autobiography set to land in book. Can't wait, can you? Bookstores ahead of Thanksgiving and Christmas in the States. People are wondering how much of this personal memoirs will be edited by um, his wife. First, it's a short break. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me noon on Saturdays and Sundays. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. 
This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hi, I'm Dawn Neeson. I'm covering for Nana today on GB News, on TV and on digital radio. Now, there's always something going on in the Royal Household, isn't there? And this week has been no different. Each Saturday, we give you the rundown. Uh, today, we are looking at the Princess Diana documentary and Harry's upcoming memoirs. Can't wait for that one. I'm joined by Richard Fitzwilliams to give us the rundown and the lowdown about what's going on with the royals. Hello, welcome to the show. Lovely to have you here, Richard. Now, first of all, I understand you've got a little exclusive peek of this new Diana documentary that's coming out on Channel 4. So can you tell us a bit about what's going on there? Yes, indeed. Nine o'clock, Sky Documentaries tomorrow night. Oh, and OK. it's called The Princess, and of course it's linked, it's a tribute this month, as you know, it's the 25th anniversary yes. of her tragic death, and director Ed Perkins has done something rather extraordinary. What he's done is compiled footage in a documentary, but for the first time, I, I've never seen anything like this before, there's no narrator. So what you have is a series of carefully chosen oh. archival pieces. Right. And the commentaries, the only commentary you get, are royal commentators of the time, and also a certain amount of vox pop with individuals in the street and individuals who were around. So there's no voiceover explaining what's going on? You That is both the good and the bad of it. It's right. good in the sense that it gives the images extra power, but what, and you're right to raise the rather unusual aspect of this, because if you, say, were 10 or, say, when Diana died and you weren't familiar with a lot of this, mm. you wouldn't know the background. The film begins when they're engaged. It doesn't... We have the opening shots, actually, outside the Ritz. We look at the paparazzi and we know tragically what that led to. Yeah, but cool. there's nothing... Uh, no images of Diana's childhood. And also... The problem, too, if you can't contextualise, they show quite a bit of the Panorama interview, which has become notorious, which Diana gave in 1995. I didn't think they were meant to be showing that anymore, anyone. It's simply that, obviously, we know William is particularly Yes, he was, he was actually spoke out, didn't he, unusually for William to, to say very strongly this should not be shown anymore. He believes it shouldn't. Yeah. Of course, that specifically was angled at the BBC mm. for obvious reasons. But this, it has to be, one has to be frank, it has to be part and parcel of any documentary of course, about yes, Diana. I, I think so. But the problem is that it can't, without a narrator, we don't know... Well, if you aren't aware that Martin Bashir dishonestly managed to, shall we say, trick, dupe Diana tragically into giving it, I do think she would have given an interview, mm. but not with not him and not in yeah. those circumstances. Yeah. And also, of course, there's no mention of a subsequent BBC cover-up. So in that aspect of it, I, I, I mean, I was riveted by the footage as a royal commentator. I remember it vividly, but if you don't, you could be somewhat confused by About, parts of it. Yeah. And the panorama aspect of it, as I say, he admitted it 
it can't be contextualized without a narrator. Do we do we learn anything new from this? As you say, it's being sold as a tribute, but is it really just going over the old ground that we already know? I don't think that it could be claimed that it's, uh, it tells us anything new, but I do think it's a very new experience to just to see footage and see how it works for you. I thought it was profoundly moving, but as I say, there are problems. I was going to say, obviously, it's, it's 25 years. I can't believe that. I can't believe it's gone that fast. And I, I was lucky enough, if that's the correct phrase, to, to cover the funeral and, and witnessed our... Um, William and Harry, who were 15 and 12 at the time, walking behind their mum's coffin. Essentially, what this does is make the viewer feel guilty because the press interest, which is so obsessive mm. in the most hunted woman in the world, the most glamorous, someone who was obviously deeply unhappy in her personal life, and yet, of course, was so brilliant for in her charitable work, the facts were supposed to, uh, supposed to indicate that it's the fascination by the public that made the press what they were. And so you do feel also somewhat guilty. Well, it, it's a guilt then that we should all share because it was, you know, the press were giving the public what they wanted. Talking of the press giving the public what they want, should we talk about Harry? And more importantly, Meghan to go with it as well, because Harry's autobiography, is it the right word, autobiography? Well, they're, I guess that apparently they are memoirs. Now, memoirs. Interesting memoirs, memoirs uh, which are, at the moment, we don't know with no exact date. What we do know is that at the end of this year, when it is assumed that his memoir might be published, there is going to be a fascinating book by the Times royal correspondent Valentine Lowe called Courtiers. Valentine was uh, famously broke the story of the alleged bullying by Meghan. It would be... F we know how he uh, handles r stories and the way he uses his sources. Also, uh, Angela Levin, the, the royal commentator, is writing a book which will be published on the Duchess of Cornwall, this year of, of course, her 75th of course. birthday. Uh, of course. Uh, the Harry and Meghan's uh, unofficial spokesperson, Omid Scobie, reportedly has a book next year. There's a cornucopia it's of these... It's a complete books. book fest, isn't it? Well, it is, a... but what Harry... Uh, uh, the problem here is it's a delicate balance, because anything he says in that book, if it's published soon, is going to be news and could be sensational and might deal with Camilla. Of course, yeah, absolutely. And the royal, the alleged royal racist who hasn't quite been named oh, yet. No, he but... said that he won't name the royal racist. Oh, I'm assuming that in this case, uh, the Sussexes mean what they say, but they are unpredictable. So just, just one quick final question for you and a quick final answer. How much of Meghan is there in this book that's coming out? Of that, we must wait and see Ooh. when the book does come out. But I think that Very diplomatic. most unlikely to write a book which she hadn't okayed. Okayed, yes, I'm sure she helped edit it. But the book mightn't come out. It might be postponed, which would be the kind thing in the Queen's of the Platinum of the Queen. Jubilee year. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Thank you so much for joining us today. That's Richard Fitzwilliam, uh, our royal expert there. Right, you're watching Dawn Neeson, covering for Nana today on GB News. More to come in the next hour. Hi, I'm Dawn Neeson. I'm covering for Nana today on GB News, on TV and digital radio. For the next hour, me and my panel will be taking on some of the big topics hitting the headlines right now. But first, let's get the latest news headlines with the lovely Bethany Elsie. Dawn, thank you. Good afternoon. It's just after 5pm. I'm Bethany Elsie here to bring you up to date from the GB newsroom. Sir Salman Rushdie's alleged attacker has been charged with attempted murder in the second degree. US officials identified the suspect as 24-year-old Hadi Matar from New Jersey. The motive for the assault is not yet known, but police believe the suspect was acting alone. Earlier today, the author's agent confirmed Mr Rushdie is on a ventilator and that he may lose an eye after he was repeatedly stabbed on stage at an event in New York State yesterday. He's faced several death threats since the publication of his book, The Satanic Verses, in the late 1980s. 
Well, a number of politicians have condemned the attack. Boris Johnson has said he's appalled that Sir Salman Rushdie has been stabbed while exercising a right we should have never ceased to defend. And French President Emmanuel Macron said for three decades Salman Rushdie embodied freedom and the fight against obscurantism. He has been the victim of a cowardly attack by the forces of hatred and barbarism. His fight is our fight. It's universal. Now more than ever, we stand by his side. In other news, there are warnings drought conditions in parts of England could last until next year. England is experiencing its driest summer for 50 years and the Environment Agency says it would take weeks worth of rain to replenish water sources. More extreme heat is expected in the south of the country this weekend, while the north is set to be hit by thunderstorms and floods. Amber weather warnings have been issued. Dr Simon Boxall is a senior lecturer of oceanography and he told GB News there could be more droughts in the future. You compare us now to 1976 when we had the last big drought, we are much better prepared than we used to be. But you have got what is tragically a sort of a, a series of events which has brought this very, very dry weather. And I think we do need to think about this in the future because we are going to see more of these droughts. Rail passengers face further disruption as drivers at nine train companies walk out over jobs, pay and conditions. Members of the ASLEF union that represents train drivers joined picket lines in northwest London this morning. Several lines are affected, including services along the west coast, LNER, London Overground and South Eastern. Some parts of the country have no services at all. The Independent's travel editor, Simon Calder, has told GB News that unions are striking now to cause maximum disruption. New court documents show the FBI has seized several top-secret files during a search at Donald Trump's estate in Florida. A federal judge approved a warrant to carry out a search at the former president's Mar-a-Lago property. It's after the US government said it's possible he had violated the Espionage Act, a law that prohibits passing on or keeping national defence information. Mr Trump has denied any wrongdoing and said the items were declassified. The Welsh Secretary has become the first Cabinet Minister to publicly switch sides in the Tory leadership race, putting his support behind Liz Truss. Writing in the Daily Telegraph, Sir Robert Buckland says he believed the Foreign Secretary's economic policy would help the country through the cost-of-living crisis. Speaking to Esther and Philip, Brexit Minister Jacob Rees-Mogg also said he's backing Liz Truss. I think having somebody um, who understands that what they thought earlier in life isn't right, and particularly with the referendum, accepts enthusiastically what the British people gave her to deal with. And she's not alone in that. I, I've always thought the most impressive Remainers are the ones who, once the result came in, said, OK, that's it, I'm accepting it, and I want now to do it properly. And there are a number of those. There are quite a lot who say that and don't really mean it. But I found in government that Liz, other than the Prime Minister himself, was my greatest supporter for getting Brexit opportunities. This is GB News. We're bringing more news as it happens now. Let's get back to Dawn. This is GB News. I'm Dawn Neeson, covering for Nana today. And for the next hour, me and my panel will be taking on some of the big topics hitting the headlines right now. This show is all about opinion. Mine, theirs, but more importantly, yours. We'll be debating, discussing, and at times disagreeing, gentlemen, in a nice way, no, obviously. We won't. Stop <laughs> it. Uh, joining me today, you've just heard him, it's former Liberal Democrat MP Lempit Opic and comedian Leo Kerth. Still to come. In just a moment, it's a difficult conversation, and today it's about destigmatizing women in a male dominated profession. She says surrounded by men today. <laughs> male dominated industries and occupations are particularly vulnerable to reinforcing harmful stereotypes and creating unfavorable environments that make it even more difficult for women to excel. I'll be joined by the general manager of Dino Rod Plumbing, Natalie McAllister, about being a female plumber. And for the great British debate this hour, I'm asking, what does it mean for the rest of the UK if Scotland leaves? Ooh. China has accused the UK of mischaracterisation, the tensions between China and Taiwan. Their foreign minister compared China's crisis with Taiwan to Scotland breaking away from the United Kingdom. 
Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has already set a date for a second independence referendum in October of next year. Should the next PM risk ignoring Sturgeon or act fast to stop her momentum? Email gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. Right, since the Lionesses, yeah, the girls did it. Claim victory. Boys didn't, by the way, did they? Claim victory at the Euros. Britons have been talking about the importance of females in male-dominated areas. Across the United Kingdom, only 1% of manual workers are women. Data from the Career Smart Union website says that the most male-dominated careers include mechanics at 99.19%, wow, carpenters at 99.1%, electricians at 98.27%, and plumbers at 98.07%. According to a poll conducted by a plumbing and drainage firm, Dino Rod, 86% of respondents claimed they would expect a male worker to show up and unblock their drains for them. Hmm. Additionally, and more shockingly, as little as 8% said they would actually hire a woman to do the job. What is wrong with you people? This begs the question, just how can these types of industries attract more females to the role? Right, I'm going to be joined actually by a woman who excels at this role, the general manager of a dino rod in the Isle of Wight and qualified plumber, Natalie McAllister. Natalie, hello, thank you for joining us. Really, really happy to have you on. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Now you're more than welcome. I'm surrounded by boys, so I need a bit of girl power here to help me out on this one. So, Natalie, um, tell me about how did you get involved in, in such a male-dominated industry in the first place? Well, it started actually from my grandmother who ran engineers when I was obviously born. It was something that we had a family full of tradesmen. And then my mother followed in her footsteps. And then I obviously followed in their footsteps, but then decided that actually, why don't we get out on the tools? So I decided to get my qualifications and thought, I'll have a go at actually seeing what it's like on the other side. And it's getting more of an understanding about what the guys are actually doing. It turns out we're quite good at it too. There is, there's no reason, Natalie, that women can't do the job of being a plumber, no, is there? Not. I mean, physically, mentally, we are perfectly adapt to, you know, a, 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 a handling a stopcock as well as the men are. We do, absolutely. And so what reaction have you, obviously your family are involved in the industry in any case, but what reaction did you have from, you know, your friends and, and, and potential boyfriends? I think generally the, the kind of consensus is that you would expect a guy to turn up, but then when a female does turn up, it's the sort of once they get over the initial shock that you can do the job as well as anyone else, then it's quite well received. And I, I think they actually prefer it. You get to a point where people actually then ask for you um, especially for the, for the older clients, mm. I think they, yeah. they actually quite like that turning up a bit later in the evening that actually a female turning up is, is quite a, a nice option. I can imagine that's the case. I mean, certainly women on their own who might feel a bit vulnerable if they have a, a, a man come around to do it. Can you give me some examples of the, the sexism that you, you still face within your industry? I think, to be fair, in my industry, we definitely been much better received once the kind of they get over that initial shock but yeah i don't i have been well received i'm very lucky and i do think um dino are kind of plugging that that we we are open to all including with you know the young kids that are getting their exam results and making decisions whether they take the the sort of standard route of university or whether people actually start looking to get into trades because i do think that is something that we need to kind of push that there are other options, you know, that earn while you learn it is is out there. Can you, you can you give me a, an example of the, of the worst incident you have faced though, when you've turned up maybe at someone's house and it's like I don't want a bird doing this job, get me a bloke, that sort of thing. I've never had it. I can honestly say Excellent. I haven't actually been in that position. No, I haven't. I've never had that problem. That's really good. And what about from, I don't know if you're married or you've got a boyfriend, what about from men you meet socially when you tell them what you, what you do for a living? What reaction do you get then? I think generally they're quite shocked, but actually it's, it's quite, a, a, it's well received. Like I said before, it, they do actually quite get interested in the fact that you are within that industry and you can talk, you know, plumbing and drains and heating or whatever it may be. 
that they get an understanding that all of a sudden you do know what you're talking about and and like i said it is well received it's 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 quite nice actually to actually be able to talk to people about trade about plumbing so what advice would you would you give natalie to sort of like you know young women watching this now about getting into the industry oh absolutely do it get involved have a look at all various types of trade there you know there is options not just on the road there's on the field and in the office that you know within this industry visit you know dino.com's got some interesting information for everybody um to have a look at and i do think just have a look at other options it is out there and it is available to all natalie sell the job to those young women what do you really enjoy about the job it, meeting people in all your colleagues and the customers there it's so varied no day is the same it, it's getting out there solutions finding those solutions to those problems that people have in everyday situations within their home it is a real job satisfaction that I, i've certainly got from it over, over the years and what was it about plumbing in particular rather than bricklaying or plastering or being an engineer or something like that I think for me, it was definitely the sort of following in my family's kind of footsteps around. I was surrounded by plumbing and heating and drainage, so that was quite an easy pick out, really. But I think, you know, there are other trades, like uh, my brother, it was in looking at carpentry, so that was another thing that was kind of on the card. So, you know, there's lots of different trades, and that skill is just, it stays with you forever. Once you've got it, you've got it, you know, and you can own, you can hone your skills and really springboard off of that and become the best you can be within your field. And it is really satisfying to, to fix stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I absolutely, I completely understand that. I mean, what, did you ever consider any other profession? I mean, something more, I hate to use this phrase, traditionally female? Um, not necessarily. I did fancy sort of a, a stint in Starlight Express because I love roller skating. <laughs> but other than that, that was about it. And you, you're still not tempted now as a sideline to take up a bit of roller. You could be no. the first roller skating plumber on the Isle of Wight. How does that sound? <laughs> yeah, that'd be quite good to get around, wouldn't it? Beat the traffic. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. Natalie, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure talking pleasure. to you. And thank uh, you. any young women out there following your footsteps and, and do, go and do what you want, girls. You can do any job in the world just because you're a girl. doesn't make any difference. <laughs> Natalie, thank you so much and good luck with that. Right, so now let's. Uh, I'm going to go back to my panel now, and, and what would you say about what Natalie said? Very impressive. Well, I've, I've just got to pull you up on the fact that you said that the men's team didn't do as well in the football as the <laughs> oh, Lionesses. Smart about the, that, are you? the thing is, the thing is, <laughs> the women's team were playing women, so it's easier. But the, the, men, the men's team play men. So, yeah, so there's it's no harder. difference. That's exactly no, it's, what I'm saying. No. But um, getting get back to this, why, why is it always, we're always trying to get women into certain jobs. You know, maybe women don't want to work in, you know, threshing. Naturally, quite threshing. clearly did. Yeah, she, she does. Nobody's, nobody's stopping her. Maybe women don't want to get their hands dirty yes, and so. covered in other people's feces. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, a, why, why aren't we trying to get men into, like, PR or whatever, you know, women-dominated jobs? Uh, actually, women's hands being covered in feces, we do most of the nappy changing as well, yeah. by the way. That includes... Yeah. A lot An of unpaid pain. role that we're very grateful for. Yes. So, Lempe, I mean, come on. Well, I, I'm uh, appalled and assaulted by what he's saying. <laughs> <I, I, laughs> to the death. Fr fr right frankly, to incredibly <laughs> upsetting and sexist, and I'm deeply offended. <laughs> uh, three examples for you. I, I'm a pilot, and uh, the lady who ran the flying school where I flew a lot was uh, in charge of the flying school because she was passionate about flying, not because she was a man or a woman, she was just passionate about flying. That's, to me, what equality is about. Um, secondly, Leo was right. Mostly uh, nurses are female. Mostly, I guess it's because of a previous position in terms of how we're made up. But as long as men can do the job, then it's OK. It can be 80-20, it doesn't matter. Uh, two other examples, I helped a lot of people, uh, females become MPs. Now, that was traditionally a male-dominated environment, and there was sexism there, but the, the, um, the public didn't feel that. The public were happy to have a woman. They didn't say, oh, of well, course. she's a woman. They said, well, that's, uh, Jenny Willett, she's the best person to be the MP for Cardiff Central and so on. So, actually, I think there's this stratum of people who sit in rooms like this saying, oh, what are we going to do about the women? If they get the breaks, they can do the job. And then the third one, I would like to say that uh, in the past, 
broadcasting was really male dominated. You don't see that. At you all. want to try newspapers back in the 1980s. Well, yeah, <sighs> well, and that's still still there to an extent. Yes, but the, for me, the success isn't that you get there because you're a man or a woman. You get there because you're the best person for the job. Having absolutely annihilated a cistern in my house uh, <laughs> because I thought I could do it myself. I wish Natalie had been round the corner there. Well, exactly. So, how would you feel, Leo, if, if a, 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 a actually, it has to be said, a, a, an attractive young woman, lovely long blonde hair like Natalie, turned up to to fix your plumbing, love? Yeah, I'd, I'd have no problem with it whatsoever. I mean, it's, it's plumbing. It's not it's not rocket science. If it was <gasps> if it was rocket science, <laughs> if it was rocket science, I'd probably want a man. <laughs> but. <laughs> you heard it first on GB. Oh, yes. That was Leo. Yes, it was, was Leo. Leo. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, we can move on, the director's just said in my ear there. Thank you very much for that one. You, you never fancied a more feminine career at all? In yeah. comedy. Manicurist? Uh, yeah. Well, com oh, you're in comedy, very... sorry. Yeah, you should have said. Is that a career, Leo, though? Yeah. Yeah. Is he well, funny? I mean, it's, come it's on. For some of but... uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, coming up, right, shush, you two. Coming up is the great British debate this hour. I'm asking, what does it mean for the rest of the UK if Scotland leaves? China has accused the UK of mischaracterising the tensions between China and Taiwan. Us? Their foreign minister compared China's crisis with Taiwan to Scotland breaking away from the United Kingdom. OK. Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has already set a date for a second independence referendum in the October of next year. Should the next PM risk ignoring Sturgeon? I mean, this trust has implied she would do that, hasn't she? Or act fast to stop her momentum. But first, it's the weather forecast. Looking ahead to this evening's weather and the UK is looking warm for many as temperatures only slowly fall away across the country. Let's take a look at the details. There will be plenty of late evening sunshine across the southwest of England with only light breezes. It will be feeling warm with temperatures still in the mid to high 20s. The temperatures across the southeast of England may be even warmer and still be in the low 30s this evening. Some high cloud may make the sunshine a little hazy though before sunset. High clouds may also be across the skies in Wales, possibly giving a vivid sunset this evening. It will be feeling warm with temperatures still in the mid to high 20s. Cloud could also be bubbling up this evening across the Midlands, but it will remain dry though with light and variable winds as well. Temperatures this evening likely to remain in the low 30s. Northeast coast of England may have a rather gloomy evening as some sea fog moves in, but for many, the day will end on a very warm and sunny note. The low cloud and fog will also affect the north and east coast of Scotland. The high ground may also see a shower develop, but for most it will be dry and warm. It's a similar story in Northern Ireland as we end the day with perhaps some cloud near the coast, but for most it will be sunny and feeling warm. Overnight we may see some showers develop in the northwest, but for most it will be dry and remaining warm. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. 
And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hi, I'm Dawn Neeson. I'm covering for Nana Today on GB News, on TV and on digital radio. Now it's time for our Great British Debate this hour. I'm asking, what does it mean for the rest of the UK if Scotland leaves? Beijing has hit out at PM hopeful Liz Truss after she condemned China for escalating tensions with Taiwan. Chinese, China's foreign ministry spokesman accused the UK of mischaracterising the situation. He went on to compare China's crisis with Taiwan to Scotland breaking away from the United Kingdom. Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has already set a date for a second independence referendum. You remember that once in a generation thing. Uh, in October of next year. But the vote would be deemed illegal unless backed by Westminster. Liz Truss has ruled out the possibility whilst accusing Holyrood of spending its entire resources on holding a second referendum. So, for the Great British Debate this hour, I'm asking what would it mean for the rest of the UK if Scotland did actually leave? Right, I'm thrilled to announce that I'm joined by the former leader of Reform UK Scotland, Michelle Ballantyne. Hello, Michelle. Good morning. Or oh, afternoon, is it? <laughs> yeah. It's been a long day. M M Michelle, I don't even know what day it is. I don't know what time of day it is. So I, I'm with you on that. Uh, Michelle, right, OK, I'm, this is not one of my strong points, this subject. So can you just explain mm -hmm. what, what Reform Scotland is, first of all? Well, um, I was the leader of UK Reform Scotland when it was set up um, to, to get them up and off onto their feet. Uh, I am no longer the leader. Um, I, I've stood down from politics at the moment. But uh, basically, what we were trying to do is offer an alternative at the time, um, particularly around the coronavirus uh, rules. Um, we believed fundamentally that free speech, um, free freedom, of our independence as individuals was being curtailed um, and we felt that needed challenging. Um, but it's also about looking at how we reset politics a bit, how we think outside the box and how we try and get out of the rut that politics seems to have got into and, and particularly in Scotland um, where everything seemed to be about independence. I mean, even the opposition parties use independence as their campaigning slogans. Um, and we felt very much that they were ignoring the things that were really important to people, which were, you know, our day-to-day -day healthcare needs, um, social care needs, the failures in education, the failures in the transport system. And instead, we're, everybody's dancing to, to the Yes Movement's tune. So it was time to kind of rethink that because really, unless you offer a good program for government, the SNP are going to be in, in, in power forever, basically. So if the SNP do get their way, what do you think it means for the UK if Scotland does leave? Well, I, I think it matters on both sides of the border. Um, we are an island. We're not a terribly big island. Um, Scotland is 33% of the land mass uh, of, of the UK, um, albeit it's only 8% of the population and 8% of the GDP. Um, so we are big on land and small in population and impact of, of you know, the, the overall activity across the UK. But it would it would make a difference and it would it would affect particularly things like um, the perception of the world. Um, I think we, the UK, rest of the UK would recover from that. But I think in the short term, there would be sense across the world that something had gone wrong in the UK. Because if you look across, there, there aren't lots of examples of, you know, one country breaking up in the, you know, in pieces when they've been in a union for such a long time and where everything is intertwined. Um, and it is worth bearing in mind that the majority in Scotland still don't want that action. Um, it is a fallacy to suggest that because 
the Yes movement have more seats in the parliament, that actually they, they hold the majority and mandate for, for the, to speak as the people, because actually they don't. They still only got less than 50% of the vote, even when you add them all up together. So the majority still want to remain part of the UK. But I think the biggest concern, if you look at it, would be things like um, that hard power, the relationship we have in terms of defence. Because at the moment, you know, as part of NATO, the UK sits on NATO, um, that northern defence ring, a lot of it sits in Scotland, and the SNP and the Greens uh, have said they want to make Scotland free from nuclear weapons. Um, and that would mean removing that defence shield that currently sits at the top of the UK. I also think it would be problematic because it would create hard borders. Um, mm -hmm. There is no way now, now we've left the EU, that you can ignore the fact that if Scotland left the UK, um, and particularly if it tried to become part of the EU, that a border is going to be created because Scotland would in effect become a foreign country. Um, and if it joined the EU, it would be part of the bloc. Now, again, that's going to be a long and tortuous journey. But I think in the short term, the EU would use Scotland leaving the UK to basically be even more difficult in its relationships with the UK. It would celebrate it. It would crow about it. But actually, it wouldn't then turn around and let Scotland in. Um, Scotland would still have to meet the requirements of the EU. And frankly, um, you know, Scotland is not going to be a net contributor to the EU's budget, and they're certainly not going to want to take on an, another country that has financial difficulties. And well, Scotland has a very large deficit. But that's a problem. I don't think Scotland, it, by the EU's rules, has the, the, the wherewithal to actually join, does it? I mean, that's, that seems to be the issue. No. And the nuclear deterrent thing is, is also a huge problem. Yes, it is. And, and I think this sort of confused position that the SNP particularly have, have promulgated that they want Scotland to be nuclear free, but they want to be part of NATO is just absolute nonsense. Can't. And, and it, 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 it absolutely underpins the problem that the SNP have in that their policies are very confused underneath when it comes to independence. And the other thing that I did, you know, that finally, uh, you know, the one thing you mentioned about the hard border, which obviously we're already experiencing all sorts of issues with, with Northern Ireland at the moment. But, you know, if Scotland becomes a foreign country and we have that hard border, then does that make Scottish people wanting to come and work in, in England, for example, then face all sorts of difficulties with doing that? And we know there's an awful lot of Scottish people that do come and work in England. Absolutely. I mean, there is a huge unknown around it. And I mean, the SNP have been campaigning for an independent Scotland, you know, for, for 70 odd years. I think it might even be longer than that now, 80 odd years. Um, and they still can't lay out what Scotland would be like, how it'd be run, what currency would have, how it would operate, how borders would work, how trade would work. You'd think after all these years, they would have some answers, yes. but they don't. And I think the reason they don't is because actually we are four nations, one country. Mm. You know, we are a family in, in the UK. And, you know, when you tear a family apart, they cannot speak to each other in a while. They can argue. They can have differences. But in the end, as they say, blood is sick in the water. You tend to come back round the table. Um, and I think that this is this is the point. Even if Scotland broke away, it would be very quickly back at the table saying, well, can we share this and can we do this together and can we have unity around that, which makes somewhat of a mockery uh, of wanting to break away in the first place. Um, and, you know, most of the trade is done across the border for Scotland. Most of our trade is with England. Mm. So, you know, what's the logic of putting barriers in the way of that? Well, we shall see what happens. Thank you very much, Michelle, for joining. That's Michelle Ballantyne there, the former leader of Reform UK Scotland. Right, let's have a quick look at what you've been saying in your messages. Valerie says it would be great not to have to deal with Nicola Sturgeon and hear her whine over and over again. Ouch. Um, John says the rest of the UK will benefit financially from Scotland leaving and the Scots get what they want. Win, win. Hmm. Meanwhile, James says to the average person, it won't make any difference whatsoever. Maybe English people might be forced to get a visa to work in Scotland or vice versa, which would be a pain though. I think it'd be more than a pain for many people, actually. OK, right. I'm Dawn Neeson. 
I'm covering for Nana today on GB News, on TV and digital radio. Coming up, we'll continue our Great British debate. I'm asking, what would it mean for the rest of the UK if Scotland did leave? You'll hear the thoughts of my panel, former Liberal Democrat MP Lempe Opic and comedian Leo Kess, who is Scottish, so this will be interesting. But first, you might have noticed, but first, the latest news headlines. Here's Bethany Elsie. Dawn, thank you. Good afternoon. It's just after half past five. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB newsroom. Sir Salman Rushdie's alleged attacker, 24-year-old Hadi Matar, has been charged with attempted murder. The motive for the assault is not yet known, but police believe the suspect was acting alone. Earlier today, the author's agent confirmed Mr Rushdie is on a ventilator and that he may lose an eye after he was repeatedly stabbed on stage at an event in New York State yesterday. There are warnings drought conditions in parts of England could last until next year. The country is experiencing its driest summer for 50 years and the Environment Agency says it would take weeks worth of rain to replenish water sources. More extreme heat is expected in the south this weekend, while the north is set to be hit by thunderstorms and floods. Rail passengers face further disruption today as drivers at nine train companies walk out over jobs, pay and conditions. Members of the Aslef Union joined picket lines in northwest London this morning. Several lines are affected, including services along the West Coast, LNER, London Overground and Southeastern. Some parts of the country have no services at all. New court documents show the FBI has seized several top-secret files during a search at Donald Trump's estate in Florida. The search was ordered after the US government said it's possible that he violated the Espionage Act, a law that prohibits passing on or keeping national defence information. Mr Trump denied any wrongdoing. And record numbers of people are getting checked for bowel cancer following the death of Dame Deborah James. The NHS has praised her campaigning and said their figures show over 170,000 people went for checks between May and June. And July, sorry. Dame Deborah, also known as Bowel Babe, died from the disease at the end of June, aged 40. On TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. We'll get back to Dawn in just a moment. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness, me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News.
Hi, I'm Dawn Neesom. I'm covering for Nana today and this is GB News on your TV and on your digital radio. Back to our great British debate this hour, I'm asking what does it mean for the rest of the UK if Scotland leaves? China has accused the UK of mischaracterising the tensions between China and Taiwan. Their foreign minister compared China's crisis with Taiwan to Scotland breaking away from the United Kingdom, kind of, I get. Um, Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has already set a date for a second independence referendum in October of next year. Should the next PM risk ignoring Sturgeon or act fast to stop a momentum, though? So for the great British debate this hour, I'm asking what would it mean for the rest of the UK if Scotland left? Whisper it quietly. So let's see what my panel make of that. Uh, formal Liberal Democrat MP Olympic Opic and comedian Leo Kirst, who may or may not be Scottish. I'm sure you'll work that one out <laughs> pretty damn soon. But this show is nothing without you and your views. Let's welcome... Oh, sorry. No, actually, no, we are going to the panel. We're not... Well, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself there. It's a girl thing today. <laughs> and, and I'm so excited by being joined by someone from Scotland who can talk about Scotland. Leo you're Scottish, evidently. I am Scottish. Yes. Yeah, although you hide it really well. I feel I feel British. The elocution <laughs> lessons have obviously worked. Go on. Well, so, I feel so what, what's what's going on here? What, what's happening here is so the SNP are a nationalist party. So you know, in in, uh, in England, you've got the BNP, the British National Party. Everybody recognises the They're dangers. Not nice people. The, the dangers of that that kind of hyper national nationalism. Mm. For some reason, the Scottish equivalent, the SNP, we've got the the BNP, the SNP. They're they're two buttocks of the of the same bum with uh, a hole in the middle, which is Nicola Sturgeon. But for some reason, for some reason, people don't recognise the the pernicious, uh, you know, just bigotry and the the, the, the SNP uh, so and it's really divisive and uh, goes unchallenged and they've, they've made Scotland into this sort of parochial inward looking state. Scotland used to basically run the UK. There's so many great Scottish mm. politicians when I worked in the civil service when I worked in the police. There's so many you know ex-military Scots in the police you know people making decisions. We've had Scottish prime ministers uh, and now I can, I can just feel that's changing. What the SNP do is they bribe young Scottish people. If you stay in Scotland and, and study there they'll pay your tuition fees so then, you know, the whole generation of Scottish kids hasn't travelled to England, studied in England, recognised that we're pretty much the same, it's just a different accent, uh, and, uh, you know, and then either taken the, that knowledge back to Scotland with them or, or stayed in England and made a cohesive country, because we're, we're one island. This idea that, that Taiwan uh, <laughs> is, is comparable to Scotland, that's a nonsense. For a start, Taiwan's its own island. And it also Tai the Taiwanese pretty much 100% want to remain Taiwanese. You know, there's, there's not... Yeah, it's not on a knife edge there at all. No. Uh, and also, you know, England uh, and, and the United Kingdom isn't an autocratic regime that, you know, has concentration camps for Uyghur Muslims and uh, all, all the rest of it. So yeah, Scotland overall wants to stay in the UK. We saw that at the last referendum. The, the problem is, I mean, the SNP are a single issue party. I can't believe that the Scottish people haven't just woken up to how terrible the SNP are. Like, the health, on every metric that you can measure a government on, on health, like, the life Life expectancy, education. If you go to Glasgow, I was in Glasgow last week. The streets are, are just it's, it's like it's like driving through Mogadishu. It's uh, you know you're, you're going to lose a tire. The whole the whole country seems to be falling apart despite getting all this extra money from from uh, from United Kingdom. So Scotland gets gets an extra fifteen or sixteen billion pounds a year more than it raises in Scotland. The, the, the latest figures, Leo. Right, the autumn budget, 2021, the largest annual settlement to Scotland since. De value, uh, de, uh, um, devolution uh, as part of levelling up. Okay, so it's yeah. a record £41 billion pounds yeah. a year to the Scottish Government. I mean, Lempit, what do you think about that? Well, first of all, I sense fear in Leo's voice because if it goes independent, you'll have to go back to Scotland, mate. No, and I can rebuild my, my comedy career in London without <laughs> you stopping me. But I digress. And more importantly, we can get the wall built as well again. Remember, uh, yes, we have one of those ones. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, that was about um, that was back to Hadrian, though. I think, yeah, I think we just facts. about remember it. I'm just about um, old enough. There's a process problem, political problem, logical problem. The process problem is once in a generation. Apparently means about once every ten years. So are we going to have best of three, best of five? Nicola Sturgeon agreed. He was saying this is the time to, to win it. Of course, uh, if they did have a second referendum and it went down, then it's dead in the water for a very long time. Um, political problem. What are they standing for? 
Previously, Sturgeon complained that she wasn't getting the oil revenues. Now she wants to shut down the oil fields mm -hmm. for the sake of this so-called climate emergency. That's where you've already made the point about the, the net profit that Scotland makes from England. And then there's a logical problem. Apparently, England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland is too big a block. But Scotland plus European Union is just right. <laughs> Come on, uh, folks. Yeah, there is Let's that. Let's just get with the programme. Just, I, I'm going to pretend to be Nicola Sturgeon here, which I have to admit is not my normal position. But they would say the once-in-a-generation thing, since they said that, a lot has changed. I mean, we have, obviously, the whole Brexit vote happened. Um, and, you know... Well, also, life expectancies in Scotland have fallen so far that basically eight <laughs> years is a generation, <laughs> almost. <laughs> so, just the point about that... Uh, uh, um, I work with the Association of Relocation and Professionals and they're trying to make the UK attractive for foreign countries. Scotland becomes a foreign country. Mm. Yeah. Let's not pretend here. Mm. It's, it's quite tough to get a visa to relocate into the UK. Funny mm. enough, that's something they work on. But Scotland's going to be part of the problem. Mm. You can't just wander down to London to work because mm. it's the same as wandering in from F France or Germany. Well, you, tell, you tell the relocation uh, people and they'll tell you there's trouble there. Leo, could this be the point then? I mean, at the moment, we are sending I illegal migrants to Rwanda. Could we end up sending Scottish people who cross the hard border illegally to Rwanda? Uh, well, I mean, it would be an improvement on uh, Motherwell. <laughs> but, I mean, oh. the, the hard border, it could mean that if you travel, if you travel up through Scotland, through Northern Ireland to, to Ireland, you're going through, uh, like, three borders and, like, uh, two different currencies, so there'll be, there'll be a hard border. And bear, bear in mind, all right, Scotland does about 66% of its trade with the rest of the UK, but that means that the UK does a pretty substantial amount of trade with, with Scotland as well, so it's not, it's not insubstantial. And, and this is why, you know, the, the border uh, counties are the, are the ones that vote, tend to vote Tory because they really don't want to leave the union. It'd be devastating. For the, for the places where I'm from, it'd be devastating for us. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, hard borders, different currencies, it's such a nonsense. It's, and it's, within, within a week, like Nicola Sturgeon, the SNP, would go from being, you know, these, uh, these brave heroes of independence to being absolute pariahs for creating this destroyed, failed couple, state. Couple, motorcycle Action. Love it. Motorcycle Action Group, it's a, it's a biking group. They love organising tours up into Scotland, mm. would you bother if you have to go through all of this trouble mm. just to ride around there? And then there's another the question I'd ask to Nicola Sturgeon. What's the benefit beyond just saying we got independence? Mm. Be specific, mm -hmm. lady. Actually, I have to say, Alex Salmon, I found him credible. He, he did paint a realistic picture of what his independent Scotland would look like. But it's nothing like Nicola Sturgeon's. Leo made the point before, it's an offence to cause offence in Scotland. Mm. Where does that end? That's not any Britain that I know. No, mm. actually. But actually the one, this might be a bit lightweight, but the one question I'd like to ask Nicola right now is... Why are you bidding to host the Eurovision Song Contest on behalf of the United Kingdom mm. when you want to get out of the United Kingdom? Yeah, and also when you want to demilitarise Scotland and we're only getting the, the Eurovision Song Contest because Ukraine can't host it because they're, they're in a war. And we've, like, the UK has given so much military assistance to Ukraine. It's really led the charge amongst Western countries. With that policy, she's hitting rock bottom and it could be her Waterloo. Mm. Oh, I see that. what you did there. Wow. See what I did there wow. for the live studio audience. Right. Wow. Okay. Here's the job. Right. Leo, here's the job. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going there. Right, uh, well, this show, thankfully, is nothing without your views. Uh, so let's welcome one of our great British voices, and this is your opportunity to be on the show and tell us what you really think about the topics we're discussing. Uh, you could even be a comedian and be funny as well. Who knows? It might be a thing. <laughs> uh, this hour, we're heading over to Edinburgh. There's a seamless link here to speak with Brian Dugan. Hello, Brian. Hello. Hello. Hi. Right, OK, you've heard what the panel have been saying on this. Uh, what does it mean for the rest of the UK if Scotland leads? What would you like to say? Well, never mind... Uh... Nicola Sturgeon's Waterloo. I think we're we're talking about Nicola Sturgeon's uh, Hadrian's Wall, um, <laughs> or maybe, maybe renaming that. I mean, it's tough enough to spend a, a Bank of Scotland ten pound note in uh, in Carlisle at present. Uh, I'm not sure that we want to 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 see how that would play out uh, if there's uh, total independence. Um, but um, look, I think I think it has it would have profound impact for the whole of these islands most of all emotionally. Um, I mean, we are very connected uh, culturally. We're very connected uh, as a society. Um, I think we've, we, politically we've seen how the, the, the separation from the EU, how that, how that has played out with my 
original homeland in uh, Northern Ireland and uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol. I mean, uh, I think we'll have about 75 renegotiations of that before it ever uh, falls into place properly. So how on earth would we make a a Scotland protocol work mm. um, if if Scotland uh, were to rejoin the EU? Mm. I think that I think that there has to be real thought put into this on a very very deep level, uh, and I agree in terms of the Scottish nationalists appear to be a uh, you know it's just a a, a one thought program, and mm. beyond that, I'm not so sure that there's uh, the 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 required thought. Uh, put in at all. Um, I think that uh, in terms of what would happen in terms of Northern Ireland uh, and perhaps uh, a reunified Ireland in terms of Wales, uh, I think it is it, it is big impact. But I think the biggest thing is perhaps Westminster really needs to think uh, very deeply most of all. Um, and clearly the union is not working for all parts of the union as uh, the various constituents would want it to work. And therefore, perhaps the deepest question must be to our politicians there. Um, yeah. Perhaps they need to make the union work more profoundly well for everyone. And then yeah. we might, might not have the Nicola Sturgeon wall put in place at the end oh, of this. I don't think anyone really wants a wall, do they? Thank you so much, Brian, for joining us this afternoon. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Uh, right, Thank today you. we're asking what does it mean for the rest of the UK if Scotland leaves? Now, this is a huge subject and lots of you have been getting in touch with your views, so thank you for that. Uh, Michael, you say, let them have another referendum. What's not to like? We would get the SNP out of Westminster and we would get a lot more money for England, Wales and Ireland. OK, Lee, you say we would finally get some peace and quiet from Nicola Sturgeon. <laughs> she's not she's not popular, is she? It has to be said. Uh, well, with the viewers at the moment, uh, Rob, uh, I left Scotland in 1979 after the first referendum and have lived in Kent ever since. Let the SNP have independence. I believe they will bankrupt Scotland and plead to rejoin the UK. Interesting. Meanwhile, Alistair, you say if the UK adopted the same model for Scottish independence that the EU adopted for Brexit, the cost of Scotland would be so high they would abandon the idea. Mm. Meanwhile, Alex says the first referendum in 1979 was the second one. Oh, well, the second one was in 2014. This will be the third one. Just how mm. many do they need? Well, OK, lots of lots of uh, interesting responses to that, so thank you all for getting in touch. Um, now, we have to move on um, from sublime to the frankly ridiculous. It's time for our quickfire quiz. I feel like I should be wearing some sort of sparkly outfit and sort of, like, you know, have some sort of music. In any case, I don't. Uh, this is the part of the show where I test my panel, these two, wish me luck, on some of the other stories hitting the headlines right now. Former Liberal Democrat MP, Olympic Opic, and comedian Leo Kers. Right, OK, can I hear your buzzers, boys? That's me. OK. That's quite good. That's like a clown's car. Yeah, thing, or a it? Canadian <laughs> trucker. <laughs> I'm not going to get through this bit, am I? Right, <laughs> now, remember, gentlemen, not to press your buzzers before I have finished the question. OK? Right? Yeah. I, 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 I'm not, I'm come not touching, on. I'm not touching Stop it. cheating there, I'm not it. touching it. Right, let's begin. Here's question one. I can see you're poised, aren't you? I'm poised. The Australian airline Qantas have made a strange request to their senior executives, but what is it? A, they have been asked to cut down on the amount of free flights they are using to reach net zero. B, they are being asked <laughs> to pitch in as baggage handlers. Or C, they are being asked to take a massive pay cut to help the company stay afloat. Ooh, Olympic. I um, hope I'm wrong, but they've been told to fly less. Kay. I hope I'm wrong. I think it's B. That is uh, that's because to, I, I read it off the telephone. I'm sorry, yeah, I was, uh, Leo is cheating now. <laughs> oh, I said Leo. down. Let's go back to Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> send them back. Or yeah, send them on. to Rwanda. And okay, so Freedom. B. Yeah. They are they're being asked to pitch in as baggage handlers. Right, OK. Uh, so Qantas is facing a labour shortage following a mass layoff and outsourcing of their ground operations. In the past, corporate workers have volunteered to stop giggling to boost morale, but now they have been specifically asked to assist. Roughly 100 senior members of staff will be helping out on the ground. Marvellous. This seems fair following mass layoffs, so, I mean, their fault, doesn't it? Right, OK, here's question two. And I'm not going to get this wrong, right? I'm actually going to make you answer it sensibly. Right. 
Following the recent droughts, Britons have been advised to limit their shower times, but for how long? The closest answer wins. Five, bit. five minutes. OK. I was going to say six, because okay. it's red Leo. bear. Four, four minutes. And I haven't scrolled down, so he's not cheating. OK, now I'm going to scroll down. And the answer is... Da, 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 da. Four minutes. Oh, Yay, no. Leo. Undefeated. I, I, so I, I unfair. I can't actually get my head around a four-minute shower. I'm not quite sure how. I never timed myself. Who times herself in the shower? Couldn't just have a bath for an hour? <laughs> Everything goes wrinkly. Anyway, <laughs> the drought has left people wondering how to cope with the lack of water. From panic buying bottles of watering houseplants, don't do that, uh, with toilet roll, uh, sorry, watering houseplants with toilet water, preferably the clean stuff. Uh, Affinity and Wessex Water have urged their customers to limit their shower times to four minutes mm. and only flush when they need to. OK, uh, four minutes, that doesn't really seem but, long enough, does it? But, you know, I'm... I'm, I'm... Chair of Parliament of Ascardia, the world's first space nation, and I know astronauts. You know they get two litres a day each? Right. On the, so you can do it. Wow. Two litres a day you can actually live on. And right. two litres to wash with. For everything. For drinking yeah, as yeah, well. they recycle it and everything. They can right. waste two litres a day. It okay. can be done, at least in the world of Ascardia. Right. In space. You have to be careful. See? Wealth of knowledge. Right, OK, uh, is question number three, and this could be the final one, cos we're having so much fun and having a tour messed it up. I hate this buzzer thing. <laughs> uh, right, the FBI searched former President Donald Trump's house after filing a warrant, but what were they looking for? Hmm. A, classified documents. B, a spare key to the White House. <laughs> Who writes this? Not me. <laughs> uh, C, an enormous amount of fake tan. <laughs> oh, go on, I bet you can't guess this one, Leo. It's A, it's class classified documents. Oh, I, I, I'm sure you're wrong, I'm sure it's... Leo? Uh, 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 I'm going to... I want it to be the spare key to the White House. Don't worry. I really want it to be uh, I, I, I want it to be fake time, to be honest with you. Uh, it is classified documents, uh -huh. which is the most boring answer there, isn't it? The FBI agents removed 11 sets of documents, all considered classified and harmful to US security. Mr Trump denied any wrongdoing and claimed the items were declassified. Law enforcement agencies around the US are reportedly monitoring online threats against the government officials that have emerged in the wake of the FBI search. <laughs> uh, right, OK, and uh, finally, one quick question. Oh, I'm spoiling us now, aren't I? <laughs> the University of Manchester has launched an inquiry into one of its PhD students after they did what? <laughs> a, wrote a research paper about masturbation. OK. Uh, B, <laughs> wrote a research paper, where is this going, about the benefits of incest? Or C, wrote a research paper about his hatred for the University of Manchester? <laughs> It's, uh, it's A, the, um, the paper about masturbation. It was actually, it was quite disturbing. I mean, this, this is how I find quite out. Quite disturbing. This is how I find out I did a joint honours. But <laughs> it's... Uh, <laughs> but no, the, it, it was quite disturbing pornography that he was looking at. You've read it, have you? No, I, but... I, it's, I, I think I said... <laughs> was it you? That was some <laughs> sort of... Uh, some sort of Japanese comic book, um, yeah, and it, like about it had uh, you know preteens in it and stuff like that. Oh, so it's, not... it's all a bit gamey and shocking. Is it? Yeah. Any case, it was the right answer. I'm not sure what prize you get for this, obviously. Four um, nil. Four uh, nil. Oh, my God. On so today's cool. show, we have been asking, is free speech under threat? Not on this show, obviously. Following the attack on Sir Salman Rushdie in response to his writings, according to our Twitter poll, 94% of you say yes, it is under attack. 6% of you say no. Hmm. Right, uh, thank you so much to my panel, former Liberal Democrat MP Lempit Opic and comedian Leo Kass. Brilliant for having you. Thank Always you so pleasure. much. It's been hilarious. Uh, and thank you at home for your company. I'm back at four o'clock clock tomorrow. Sorry about that. But now <laughs> I'll leave you with the weather forecast and have a wonderful evening. Looking ahead to this evening's weather and the UK is looking warm for many as temperatures only slowly fall away across the country. Let's take a look at the details. There will be plenty of late evening sunshine across the southwest of England with only light breezes. It will be feeling warm with temperatures still in the mid to high 20s. The temperatures across the southeast of England may be even warmer and still be in the low 30s this evening. Some high cloud may make the sunshine a little hazy though before sunset. High cloud may also be across the skies in Wales, possibly giving a vivid sunset this evening. It will be feeling warm with temperatures still in the mid to high 20s. Cloud could also be bubbling up this evening across the Midlands.
start, it will remain dry, though with light and variable winds as well. Temperatures this evening likely to remain in the low 30s. Northeast coast of England may have a rather gloomy evening as some sea fog moves in, but for many, the day will end on a very warm and sunny note. The low cloud and fog will also affect the north and east coast of Scotland. The high ground may also see a shower develop, but for most it will be dry and warm. It's a similar story in Northern Ireland as we end the day with perhaps some cloud near the coast, but for most it will be sunny and feeling warm. Overnight we may see some showers develop in the northwest, but for most it will be dry and remaining warm. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. Join me, Darren Grimes, for Real Britain every Saturday and Sunday from 2pm. A news hour that comes with a trigger warning. Scorching hot opinion with prominent guests saying the unsayable and a little bit of weekend fun thrown in. Unlike other broadcasters, I won't be forgetting what the B in our name stands for. So how are you in for Real Britain Saturday and Sunday from 2pm? My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there.